Honorable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of International Trade. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's my honour today to rise uh, to speak to this House on Bill C-36, which, as you know and as members of this House knows, is the government's response to what's known collectively as the Bedford decision, uh, a decision of the Supreme Court from last December uh, that struck down several criminal code pr uh, provisions related to prostitution, uh, things like solicitation, things like living off the, uh, the avails, Mr. Speaker. And it's important to note, it seems my, my friends in this House uh, who, uh, um, rather than looking at the substance of this bill, start looking at future charter challenges, should look at what the Supreme Court did, Mr. Speaker. In fact, they invited Parliament to step in and fill the void caused by their striking down of some of these provisions under, uh, uh, under the Charter. And they gave Parliament uh, one year to come up with adequate uh, rules to address the social harms that are caused by prostitution. And certainly, I think all members of this House would agree uh, when it comes to human trafficking, when it comes to exploitation, there are vast risks, immense risks, within prostitution, within the sex trade uh, for Canadians. And it, it's, it's important for Parliament to make sure that the public good and public safety is protected. So what happened was the creation of the Canadian model, Mr. Speaker. Um, after consultations within the department with stakeholder groups, with people that have worked with, uh, with women who've left the sex trade, the Canadian model was our government's response to the invitation from the Supreme Court of Canada to make laws to protect vulnerable Canadians. And I'll take a few moments to talk about the main pillars of C-36, which is our response. First, it's criminalizing demand, Mr. Speaker. This is recognizing that in the vast, vast majority of cases, the prostitutes, mainly women, but some young men as well, um, are, are victims here. And law enforcement resources and criminal justice resources should not be focused on them. It should be focused on exploitation. So the first is to try and stem demand by focusing on the Johns and criminalizing that activity. The second is to criminalize exploitation surrounding that. The human trafficking we've heard some members of Parliament talk about, the t traditional pimps, the people that lure young women into this trade uh, and then and almost entrap them in it. There's a third, restrictions on advertising, Mr. Speaker, about sexual uh, s services and their sale. Um, an important distinction in the Canadian model is the criminalization of communication in public places for the purposes of prostitution, where those public places reasonably could be expected to have children. So this will uh, ensure that certain public areas um, don't see the sex trade on a daily basis. There's increased penalties for child prostitution, Mr. Speaker, which I'm sure all members of this House agree with that provision of C-36. There's a clear message in the bill to immunize prostitutes and sex workers themselves, recognizing, as I said earlier, Mr. Speaker, that most often they are victims in this trade. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the seventh sort of pillar I take from C-36 is direct aid, $20 million to begin with, Mr. Speaker, to help with transitional work for some of the vulnerable people that feel that there is no way out of the trade that they might have been lured or exploited into, these transitional services, and some of the exceptional Canadians, volunteers and groups working with them uh, will receive this money to help people transition. And my friend from Malpac said, you know, this bill doesn't see the reality of the world. And some of the MPs in the NDP seem to think that this is bound for, uh, for strike down at a future date by a court because it's, it's a conservative or some political ploy. Well, Mr. Speaker, if those members of the opposition actually looked at the substance of C-36, they would see that Canada is not really out of step with trying to deal with the harms of prostitution. In many ways, the Canadian model builds on the Nordic model, Mr. Speaker, which was introduced in Sweden in 1999 and followed subsequently by Norway and Iceland. These are European countries 
We have strong relationships with free and democratic societies that have tried to address the social harms of prostitution through a model that criminalizes the demand, goes after the exploiters, Mr. Speaker, exactly. and not the women. Well in 2014, the EU and the Council of Europe actually recommended the Nordic model, to which C36, our model, is, is clearly heavily based, to all member countries. So, Mr. Speaker, I would suggest the NDP and the Liberals are the ones that need to hit the reality of the world when it comes to how to address the evils and harms caused uh, within the sex trade. And it's supported, Mr. Speaker. It's supported by leading figures within those that try and deal with human trafficking and exploitation. It's supported by many uh, people that work as advocates in abuse centres, rehabilitation shelters. The Canadian Police Association firmly supports it, Mr. Speaker. And members of Parliament have been reaching out and talking to stakeholders. I met with sex workers to hear their perspective. They were very, uh, very earnest in their presentations to me, and I appreciated that. I also listened to law enforcement and researched the Nordic model, Mr. Speaker, as, I, as every MP should. And I'd like to thank a constituent of mine from Newcastle, Tony Rita. I've had several exchanges with Tony, a 32-year veteran from the Toronto Police Service who over decades worked with vulnerable women on the streets in Toronto. He sees the Canadian model that we're bringing in response to the Bedford decision as a way that will reduce harm, Mr. Speaker. And that should be all parliamentarians' goals in this space. So I'd like to thank Tony law enforcement workers from across the country and people working in shelters and, and with abused women for their work getting uh, vulnerable Canadians out of this trade, Mr. Speaker. And finally, this topic goes to the root of parliamentarians as Canadians, Mr. Speaker. I'm the MP for Durham, but I'm also a father, a proud father of an eight-year-old girl who is the apple of my eye. I cannot stand in this House and say that there's any public good in creating and promoting a legalized sex trade, Mr. Speaker. I think, in fact, it's abhorrent to suggest to our young women that this should be an industry that is considered, Mr. Speaker. I want my young daughter to sit in this House one day, perhaps in the front bench, to, to go further than her old man. Our young women can do anything in this country, Mr. Speaker, and I think to, to support the, the institution of uh, normalization of sex work like this is not in the public good. And it reminds me, Mr. Speaker, of the philosopher John Stuart Mill, who said, no person is an entirely isolated being, Mr. Speaker. So Ms. Bedford, and a few sex workers who may feel that they are empowered and there's no social harms in their life from their participation in the sex trade. They don't speak for the homeless Aboriginal youth in Winnipeg, Mr. Speaker. They don't speak for abused women who've been forced into sex work by pimps, by in some cases uh, ex-boyfriends. They don't speak for the vulnerable, Mr. Speaker. And the vulnerable are the vast majority of people drawn in to prostitution. So as parliamentarians, it's our duty to ensure that our response to the Supreme Court decision in Bedford is a response that reduces harm and that discourages more people going into a practice that has drugs and crime at the centre of the practice, Mr. Speaker. And I, I once again say, I also don't think that our response as a parliament should be to normalise this as an option for many of our young people and our young women, Mr. Speaker. Certainly that's not why I ran for parliament. Thank you very much.